It was snowing. Cold darkness spread out in all directions on the other side of the car window, and all I could see was a single cedar tree. But the slowly falling snow gave off a small white light and refused to be swallowed by the darkness. I turned my gaze to the front. The image of myself, my elbow on the door and head leaning on my hand looked back at me. Those cold eyes of a man out for revenge looked a little too calm. Especially considering the person I was about to take revenge on was on this very same bus. My younger sister Miho died two weeks ago. She jumped from her eighth floor veranda to the car park below. It was snowing that day as well. The snow that started falling that afternoon had, by evening, coated the car park with a thick white dusting. But that snow didn't soften Miho's fall. All it did was absorb her blood and turn red. Her apartment looked like she was ready to move, boxes packed and ready to go. And her suicide note had been left on top of one of those boxes. This single piece of paper was folded and open, and there were only a few short, curt lines. And those words, written in a familiar hand, said, I can no longer trust anything in this world, having been betrayed by you, the one I trusted the most. There is no point living anymore, and I have decided it's no longer necessary either. Yamahashi Miho. Because of this, the police concluded that it was a suicide, and I accepted that she jumped of her own free will as well. But the fact that it wasn't an impulsive act, but something she carried out very deliberately, left me in shock. I had spoken to her on the phone the day before the incident. She seemed perfectly fine at the time, like everything was going well. Miho graduated from junior college the year before, and then she remained in Tokyo and started work at a travel agency affiliated with an electric rail company. It was a nice place to work, and she was satisfied with her job as well. When she returned home for Obon, she let it slip to me and me alone that she was dating one of her co-workers. And during our last conversation, she told me that she planned to go on a ski trip with some of her colleagues during the New Year's holidays, and that co-worker would be there as well. Sounds like things are going great, I said, and I can still hear her truly happy voice ringing in my ears. Yeah, everything is going well. So then, why did Miho have to die? What happened during the day after we got off the phone that made her jump? But the police didn't seem to be interested in that, and they chalked it up to her simply being upset at being rejected. I asked the detective in charge to look into who Miho was dating, but the only answer I got was that there was apparently nobody at her workplace like that. According to the detective, not a single colleague of hers said that she appeared to be dating anyone at the company. On the contrary, they seemed surprised to hear from the detective that she was dating someone. I kept trying to tell them that there was no way that could be true. But in the end, she left a note, and there were witnesses, and in such clear-cut cases of suicide, they didn't carry out investigations. So that was the end of that. Several sleepless nights passed after that. Miho and I had a great sibling relationship. She adored me even more than I adored her. And there was someone out there who betrayed her, who hurt her so badly 
she lost all hope. I couldn't bear the thought, and I took it out on anyone and everyone. Before long, everyone stayed far away from me. But still I couldn't get the shadow of this person out of my head. And it was then that I realised that I couldn't rely on the police. I decided to uncover the truth about Miho's suicide with my own two hands. I would find that man, and I would make him take responsibility for Miho's death. He had to pay. And so, I hit upon a plan. I would join the ski tour that Miho and her colleagues were going on. The tour Miho should have been on. I would uncover who Miho was dating, and I would make him pay. Two birds with one stone. Luckily, Miho had told me quite a bit about that tour. Even when and where the bus was leaving from. A week after Miho's death, I finally found a reason to wake up the following day. But still I couldn't sleep at night. But this lack of sleep was completely different to usual. In fact, this time around, it felt rather good. At some point, it started to snow. The clock passed midnight. The bus continued up the mountain pass. I looked around the inside. Two-thirds of the seats were full, and most of the passengers were asleep. The only thing I could hear was the roar of the bus's engine. There were roughly five groups on the tour, and most of them were young, around the same age as me. I watched everyone closely once we gathered at the bus stop, but I still wasn't sure which group consisted of Miho's colleagues. It would obviously be better to find out who they were as soon as possible, but there was no need to rush. There was plenty of time. I put my hands into my po the pockets of my down jacket and checked that the mountaineering knife I'd put in there was still there. Miho gifted it to me when I was in the mountaineering club at university, although I had barely ever used it. It was almost like a good luck charm to me, but this time around, it would carry out its most important role ever. That of revenge. As I dreamt about the moment in my head, I slowly closed my eyes. It happened so suddenly. The moment I heard the brake slam on, the bus started shaking left and right, as though it was stuck on something. I had been dozing, and so I wasn't able to react quickly my head banging left and right as I muttered, What is going on? The luggage above our heads fell to the floor all over the place. As I managed to grab the handhold on the seat in front of me, someone near the front of the bus screamed, and at the same time, the bus shuddered with impact. It seemed we'd hit something, but still the bus didn't stop and kept going. I looked outside the window, the broken guardrail screeched as the bus ran alongside it. The other side of the guardrail was a cliff, and beyond that, thin air. I finally realised that that was exactly where the bus was heading. Finally, the shaking subsided. It was followed by a floating sensation that I felt through my feet. I tightly gripped the hand grips. The bus was no longer touching the ground at all. All I could hear were the other passengers' screams. But only a few seconds later, there was an impact so loud it drowned out their screams, and at the same time, the impact tore through my body as well. A lone woman stood on the railing on the balcony. Fluttering snow made it hard to see, but I knew exactly who it was. 
It was Miho. I watched her from the side, wondering where on earth we were. And then, for some reason, I understood what she meant to do. Stop! I screamed. But my voice apparently didn't reach her ears. It was just like screaming at someone on the TV. As I went to scream again, Miho suddenly turned and looked at me. She was standing directly on top of the railing, so it really was like watching something through a TV. It didn't feel real, and I couldn't see the expression on her face very well either. But those eyes staring at me held deep resentment behind them. Seeing the violent anger on her face that I never once thought I might see, I opened my mouth in shock. Then she turned to face the front again and put her hands together as though in prayer. Then she slowly closed her eyes, leaned forward, and threw herself into the air. Her loosely bound hair and long skirt flooded in the breeze as Miho fell into the evening air. My gaze fell with her, as though following her. In this space where everything felt unreal, her acceleration through the air alone felt true. Right before my eyes, her body approached the light dusting of snow on the parking lot. I stared at what seemed to be her cold, emotionless profile. Miho, did you die just like this? What on earth was that look you gave me? And what on earth did you regret? But we were too close to the ground to ask Miho that. And then... I felt my body going flying, and I opened my eyes. Seemed I was lying on my side. I put my hands out in front of me and opened my eyes slightly. On the floor in front of me, a cheap-looking light designed like a chandelier gave off a bitter orange glow. It was one of the lights from inside the bus. Then it finally hit me. The bus had gone over the edge of the cliff. The bus had flipped over onto its roof. I was lying on the ceiling. I sat up and checked to see if I was hurt. I hurt all over, but it wasn't unbearable, and thankfully, I didn't seem to have any major injuries. I stood up, careful not to hit the seats poking out above me, and looked around. Passengers were passed out in various states of injury. There were some plain lying down. Others were lying with their arms bent at unnatural angles. There were others with their legs bent similarly. And some necks. And bodies. They were all twisted. Under the bright orange lights, these figures looked like dolls whose strings had been cut. Here and there, they were covered in dark blood. I could hear people crying in pain, but their voices were faint and vague. This is hell, I thought. I lifted my head to avoid the sight. I could see the rear window behind the upside-down back seat covered in blood, but it only reflected the inside and I couldn't see out it. I noticed the man lying in front of that window was twitching, and I took a step forward. At that moment, the floor beneath my feet trembled, and I stumbled forward. The bus shook, and the sound of metal scraped. I let out a pathetic scream and lowered myself at the ready. Once the bus stopped tilting, I heard a voice coming from behind me. Not that way! This way! I nervously turned towards the voice. 
A shadowy hand reached out of the darkness towards me from the shattered front windscreen. The headlights seemed to be broken and I could only see a dark silhouette, but judging from the voice, it seemed to be a man. The bus is half over the cliff. If you keep going that way, you'll fall. The man said in a panicked tone and beckoned for me to come closer. I gave a small nod and, like a balancing toy on the ceiling, proceeded towards the front of the bus. For a moment, I worried about the man in the back seat, so I turned around. He wasn't moving at all. I couldn't tell if he was alive or dead, but either way, there was no way I could help him now, and I continued moving forward. The man's body suddenly jerked like a fish. The bus started to tilt again. I gulped and waited to see what would happen next, praying that nothing would. But the metal roared like a beast, and again the bus started to fall. I ran up the diagonal ceiling towards the front windscreen. The bus held at a 45 degree angle, but then started to slide down the cliff. As I took a step forward, so did the floor, no, the ceiling, move beneath me. It was just like running up an escalator going down. I was like a mouse running at full speed inside a wheel. I ran and ran, but that just made the wheel I was in move faster as well, and I couldn't move a single step forward. Suddenly it felt cold beneath me and I tried to slow down. But more than two thirds of the bus was sticking out over the cliff. Even if I stopped, there was no doubt that the bus would fall. Summoning all my strength, I started running even faster. Finally, I reached the driver's seat. It had only been about two seconds, but it felt much longer to me. The man lay down in, on his stomach and reached his hand out through the windscreen. Grab on, quickly, it's going to fall. His screams mixed in with the numerous other voices. Seemed there were other people there too. I thrust my right hand forward and jumped. As I did, a man in uniform to my left crawled out of the shadows. It was the driver. He tried to stand up, using the seat for support, but then he lost balance and fell towards me. I grabbed the falling driver and tightly gripped his belt. I grabbed the falling driver and tightly gripped his belt. Then, with my free hand, I tried to grab the other man's hand. I stood on one of the lights and extended my arm as far as I could. It worked. The man tightly and securely grabbed my hand and then started pulling me and the driver up. I looked up at the man right in front of me once more. He looked strong, like he was a size bigger than me. It didn't look like he'd struggle pulling up two people. Suddenly, it felt like the driver hanging from my other hand got heavier. He'd lost consciousness. Grabbing that man's hand first was the right decision. If I'd done things the other way around, then the driver and I both would have fallen all the way to hell together. The man pulled us out of the bus, and when I planted my feet on the ground, the bus started falling through the air again. I crouched down and looked behind me. That large bus looked the size of a small box before it was swallowed up in the darkness. For a moment, it looked like a steel coffin. 
Finally, when I could no longer see it, I heard what sounded like thunder. Having finally reached the top of the cliff, I bent down on the snow and took a deep breath. I had no energy left in my limbs and felt just like a stick. But the fact that I was well and truly alive was beyond doubt. The clouds moved through the sky swiftly. The moon occasionally poked its face out through the thick shadows. The snow shone white as it absorbed the moonlight. You could say the scenery was beautiful. But the whiteness of that snow, compared to the bright orange scene of carnage I just witnessed, seemed nothing more than a fabrication. Even though this snowy scenery was a perfectly normal sight. That was close. The man who pulled me up crouched next to me. I thanked him, and then asked him a question as I stood up. Who are you? What on earth happened? The moment I stood up, I almost fell over again. The man held me up and smiled. He looked just like a child. Don't ask so much at once. Let's just calm down first, yeah? The man was so muscular that I could tell it even through his thick sweater, and he had a strong, square chin and thick, strong-willed eyebrows as well. But his small eyes beneath those made him look gentle and kind. They kind of reminded me of an elephant's eyes. As for your first question, my name is Kajino. I'm an office worker. The other three here are my colleagues. The man called Kajino pointed to the two men and one woman who stood beside him. They were all young, around the same age as me. He introduced the man of medium build with glasses as Kizawa. He was a rather handsome man. The other man, who was rather skinny and tall, like a matchstick, was Murata, Kajino said. He had a thin, nervous-looking face. Then Kajino pointed to the woman and said, And this is Sasaki. She had a strong face, with a well-defined nose, but she still held a feminine charm to her as well. However, I could tell she was pale even under all her heavy makeup. Even as Kajino introduced them all, she lowered her head, her bob cut covering her eyes, and rubbed her rather slender body in the cold. That bus fell head first and then flipped like this, right? Kajino demonstrated the bus turning with his hands. We were all sitting in the back. That was how we got out. I nodded. It seemed that the driver and I, and Kajino and the other three, were the only ones who escaped for a total of six people but I couldn't get the words office worker out of my head. It reminded me of Miho. If Miho's partner was still on that bus, then there was nothing left for me to do. But if these people worked at the same company as Miho, then I still had to carry out my mission. Even though the bus accident had been an unexpected event, I couldn't just go home dejected. I had to ascertain the meaning behind that look Miho gave me in the dream. So the rest of my life didn't become meaningless, but most of all, for Miho herself. At that point, Kajino asked me for my name. I stopped myself just as I was about to blurt it out. If they really were Miho's colleagues, then there was a good chance that hearing the same last name as hers would set them on edge. I'm Takeda, 
I lied. Kajino nodded. Well then, that answers the first question. I have one more, but it's just something I want to know because I don't really get it. Kajino turned his gaze to the bus driver lying beside me. But it looks like there's someone else who can answer that for me. All thanks to you. At that moment, the driver opened his eyes and sat up. The driver shook his head and then looked around, and Kajino told him about the bus driving over the cliff and into the valley, and how the six of us were the only ones who survived. The driver lifelessly nodded, then vaguely looked over the edge to where the bus had plunged. Kajino asked him why the bus went over the edge. The driver, Kawamae, said, That, I don't really know. It happened when we approached the rather harsh curve. Suddenly the steering stopped working. It looked like something dark moved out of the corner of my eyes, but I don't really know. At any rate, I couldn't turn the bus and I slammed on the brakes, but it just made us slide across the snow and the bus kept going anyway. And then we hit the guardrail and… The driver then lowered his head and apologised to us. At any rate, I'm terribly sorry. I suppressed a sudden impulse to scream. Screaming wouldn't solve anything and the driver looked absolutely miserable, so I lost all willpower. Kawamaya was four or five years older than us, so probably just about to turn 30. He was still rather young for a bus driver. But this mistake was far too big to simply forgive because of his lack of experience. Well then, what are we going to do now? Kajino said so that we could all hear it. Murata spoke up. First of all, we should find someone who can help us. We'll freeze to death if we stay here. And go where? Kizawa asked. If we start moving about recklessly, we might get lost. That may be true, but it's no different to us remaining here, Murata shouted nervously, just as I expected of him. Kajino calmed him down and looked at me. How about you, Takeda-san? I looked around the area. We were standing on a piece of flat land sticking out of the rocky cliff about 15 metres wide. Something like a ledge. Behind us, the rocky cliff seemed to go on forever above us, and it was impossible to tell where we fell from. This piece of flat land, without a single blade of grass on it, sat between the rocky cliff and the abyss where the bus had fallen below. Nothing but pitch black darkness spiralled out below, and it was impossible to tell how high up we were. There was a spot by the edge of the cliff where the snow had been scooped out and shattered glass lay all over the ground. That was where the bus fell. You could call it the location where life and death split apart. If that spot had been just a few metres away, then the bus would have simply kept going over the cliff. A chill ran down my spine, and I shook my head a few times, drawing my gaze away from the edge of the cliff. The rocky wall behind me loomed directly in front of the cliff, blocking the path in front of me. Although the cliff face was rather sudden, it also had a bit of a slant to it, so it might be possible to climb. After confirming that, I turned my eyes to the left. A gentle slope continued into the darkness, 
where a pitch black forest then spread out. Meaning, we were surrounded on three sides by cliffs and rock faces, and the other side spread out into a forest. I decided to leave this spot by heading down the cliff and into the forest on the left. I decided to head down to the forest, the only place that looked like it had a path. Normally, the best course of action would be to wait here for help. But something didn't feel right to me. A voice in my head was screaming that I had to get away from there. Snow blew in from above and clouded our view. Suddenly, something smelt sour. First things first, we should get out of here. The forest would be much safer than staying here. Everyone nodded in agreement. All except one. If you want to go, then go. I'm going to climb up there instead. Murata turned to the rock face behind us. I looked up at it, just like him. He was going to climb it. It would be tough even at the best of times, but with all that snow on it, and only the moon to light the way, there was no way. All it took was one person acting recklessly to cause a dangerous situation to get even worse. And that was the one thing we had to avoid. I tried to persuade him otherwise. Hey, Murata-san, I don't think you should. I can do it. He interrupted. His tone was as cold as the winds assaulting the cliff. It would be easier for them to find us the closer we are to the road. I shook my head. It's impossible. Even so, I have to try. Then he looked at Sasaki. Right, Sasaki? After she jumped, Sasaki lowered her head. I... I... She continued muttering. I don't want anything bad to happen to anyone. She said in a small voice, but I clearly heard it. But Murata didn't listen and started climbing the cliff face. Murata! Didn't you hear what Dia said? Kizawa called out after him. Murata replied without stopping or turning to face us. Kizawa, you have no right to stop me, so shut up. His tone was still cold and sharp. Kizawa froze on the spot. Murata recklessly scaled the cliff for Sasaki, and Kizawa had called her Die. A strange, awkward atmosphere surrounded these two men because of Sasaki Die, and I was unable to say anything to either of them. As I watched Murata impatiently climb the cliffside in silence, I saw something move towards the top far above him. It was big enough for me to see it from where I was standing, and at first, I thought the rocks themselves had moved. But there were two red lights shining in that large black shape, and they slowly, creepily shook left and right so there was no way it could be something inanimate. Suddenly the moon disappeared behind some clouds. In an instant, the scenery before me disappeared in the darkness. That large black shape also melted into the darkness. But those two red lights, no doubt about it, they were eyes, and they alone remained lit in the darkness. They looked like candle lights, the colour of blood. As the eyes shook up and down, 
they started to descend towards us. I heard Murata scream. It was like his final death throes, so loud that I almost had to cover my ears. But then the scream suddenly cut off, like a bag full of water being crushed. The moon appeared again, and the darkness receded. It was but a brief moment, as the clouds cut across the sky. A clump of meat that had once been Murata fell before us. Then that thing crawled towards us on all fours. White mist like smoke from a machine emerged from its mouth as it breathed. Even on all fours, it was taller than us. Its front legs, the same thickness as a woman's waist, stepped forward and it slowly walked towards us. We watched it quietly, like it was something from another world. But the sound of the thing as it stepped on Murata's head and crushed it like a watermelon shocked us back to reality. The five of us turned our backs to the thing and took off for the forest. It roared. The sound rumbled through the air behind us. It sounded like nothing I'd ever heard from an animal before. But it was very clear that the creature was full of rage. Fighting the urge to turn and look back, I kept running. The cliff continued along our right-hand side. Rocks tumbled down from up above. They were about the size of fists. Really? At a time like this? I thought, batting them away with my hands. At that moment, I heard someone fall down behind me. I instantly turned around. Blood poured from Kizawa's head as he hunched over. A rock had hit him square on. That thing was right behind us. Its eyes sparkled red. Kizawa-san! Sasaki stopped and turned to run back to Kizawa. The speed with which she tried to save him made it seem like they were more than just friends. I clucked my tongue again. Why did this have to happen again? I stopped, grabbed Sasaki's arm as she tried to return for Kizawa, and pulled her back. I stopped and instinctively grabbed Sasaki's arm as she tried to return for Kizawa, pulling her back. It was too late to save him now. That was why I stopped her from needlessly dying, too. If I had to give a reason for my actions, it would be something like that. It had nothing to do with humanitarianism or morality. But it seemed that Sasaki had her own reasons that went beyond that. She writhed and screamed. Let me go! It's too late. I gripped her arm tighter. You can't help him, and that thing is getting closer. I don't care! Let me go! I won't be the only one left alive! She was almost screaming, and for a moment, I almost let her go. Because I remembered the final words Miho left behind. At that moment, A bunch of rocks tumbled down to the exact spot Kizawa was lying, with a loud roar. They crushed him in an instant, and created a wall of rocks. They blocked the road so that the thing couldn't get through. 
All of the power drained from Sasaki Rie's arms. She stood there absent-mindedly, staring at the rocks that Kizawa lay beneath. Let's go. Kajino-san and Kawamae-san are waiting. I urged her and turned around. It seemed there were falling rocks this way as well, and a large rock fell down a few meters ahead of us as well. If I let her be and ran off into the forest, then no doubt she'd be crushed beneath those rocks as well. Was that what they called fate? Beyond the falling rocks, Kajino waved at us. I waved back. That thing behind us roared. It appeared to be attempting to climb over the rocks. It would absolutely get over them and come to kill us. Somehow, I knew it would. That was why we had to get as far away from it as possible while we still could. Let's go, I said to Sasaki again, grabbing her hand and walking towards the forest. She silently followed me. So, yeah, that's all about the ski trip. But there was one more thing I wanted to tell you about. Up until that point, she'd spoken cheerfully about the ski trip she was going to take during the upcoming New Year's holidays, but then Miho's tone of voice changed. I adjusted my grip on the receiver. Sure, today I... Yeah? A colleague at work told me they liked me. But... You're acting a little strange now. Sorry. You suddenly started speaking so seriously that I was wondering what was going on. It's no laughing matter. That colleague was very serious. Sorry, sorry. So then, what did you say? Well, I... Yeah? There's someone I already have my heart set on, I said. For a moment, I was speechless. I thought she was still just a kid. Is it that guy you're going on a ski trip with soon? Yeah, well... And what did your colleague say? Is that person someone I know? And? You don't know them, I said. You should have told him. Even if you don't work in the same area, you still work for the same company, right? I can't say something like that. I guess things are still a little troublesome at times like this when you're in the same company. I see, but still, I feel a little bad for the guy who confessed as well. Eh? What do you mean by that? I proposed to Nami today. This time Miho was at a loss for words. It was more effective than I thought. I could sense how surprised she was from her silence. Nami, you mean the girl you introduced to us this summer? Yeah, Orita Nami. And how did it go? Without a hitch, she took the ring. She fell silent again. Her reaction was a little different to what I was hoping for. I see. Congratulations. Miho's voice seemed to drop out through the phone line, conveying how she felt. Seemed she was still surprised. What's up? You don't seem very happy about it. No, that's not it at all. I'm glad, really. 
Thank you, I said, and she replied, You're welcome, with a laugh. All right, I gotta work early tomorrow, so I gotta go. I'll bring you back some souvenirs from my ski trip, all right? Thanks, and I hope things go well with your guy too. Thanks, I'll talk to you later. See ya. Once I heard the phone hang up, I put the receiver down too. That was the last conversation I ever had with Miho. Having lost my sister by the time only half my life had passed, I suddenly found myself in a dark forest. It was pitch black, and all we could hear were the sound of our own footsteps. The trees, lit by the faint moonlight that broke through their branches, rose high like soulless giants. Suddenly, we heard a sound coming from behind us. The four of us instantly turned around. Snow fell from a branch above us. The branch could no longer support its weight, and so the snow fell off. It was as though the forest was trying to drive us out, the intruders keeping it from its peaceful sleep. So, about those falling rocks. Kajino broke the silence. I think that when the bus went over the cliff, it must have hit it and loosened some of the rocks, which then fell. Nobody responded. Maybe that was it, but nobody cared. I knew it was my fault! Suddenly Sasaki stopped and started crying in her hands. If I had just gotten rid of the baby, then Miho and Kizawa-san and Murata-san would still be alive. I couldn't believe my ears, but she had most definitely said, Miho. Kajino grabbed her shoulders and shook her. What are you saying? Their deaths had nothing to do with your child. This child you speak of... Is Kizawa-san the father? I asked. I remembered her trying to help him. Takeda-san, I'm sorry, but this has nothing to do with... It does. Let me tell him. Sasaki cut Kajino off and turned to me. That's right. Kizawa-san is the father. We didn't realize it until after we broke up. She looked down and continued. It was over a stupid little fight, but with the baby coming, I was hoping we could get back together. I was unable to say anything, however, so I spoke to Kajino-san and Murata-san about it. So they suggested we all go on a trip and use that opportunity to get things out in the open. And... I nodded. I understood why Murata pushed himself to try and climb the cliff. He was shouldering the burden for the pregnant Sasaki. But what about Miho? And this... Miho? He hadn't said much up until that point. But suddenly Kawamae, the driver, spoke up. Miho. She joined the company this year under the name Yamahashi. Kizawa-san set his sights on her after we broke up. Sasaki's voice trembled as she continued to look at the ground. When I heard that, I was overcome with passion and pressed her to quickly give up on him. I said some truly terrible things to her. And then? The next day, she jumped from her apartment. 
When she was done, she covered her face and started crying again. When you pressed her, what did she... this... Yamahashi-san? I asked. I tried desperately hard to make sure my voice didn't quiver. Kajino answered instead. Apparently, she refused Kizawa's advances. My heart is already set on somebody else, she said. It was the same as what Miho told me. But... But she killed herself. That had nothing to do with Sasaki. Yamahashi had no interest in Kizawa. You're wrong. I killed her. We were good friends, and I called her a thief, and the shock was too much to bear. Sasaki broke down in tears. Kajino placed a hand on her shoulder and turned to us. I told you, it has nothing to do with that. You guys think so too, right? I can't say for certain, but I doubt you had anything to do with it, Kawamaya said. Whether he was acting or not, his tone sounded convincing. When I spoke to Miho that night, she must have already had her fight with Sasaki. Yet she sounded completely normal and didn't mention the fight at all. Generally, quarrels like that are usually the result of a misunderstanding. But I agreed with Sasaki. There was no other way to see it. Miho's death was because of her. The person she referred to as you, in her final note, had to refer to Sasaki. Plus, most decisively of all, Miho jumped that very same night. Yes, Miho was betrayed and became a dead victim because of it. I felt myself getting worked up. Finally, I knew the reason for her death and who I should take revenge on. Even though the cause was a stupid misunderstanding, they had to take responsibility for causing Miho's death. One had already been crushed under a rock and died. The other was crying her eyes out in front of me. Something made a sound behind us again. We all fell silent when we heard it. The noise stopped as well as though matching us. That wasn't the sound of falling snow. That was the sound of something alive. I turned to look in the direction of the sound, but I couldn't see anything but darkness. However, we all sensed that something evil was out there. It was back. We decided to climb a random tree and wait for it to pass. We decided to climb a random tree and wait for it to pass, choosing a tree that even during this season was green and started from Sasaki. She climbed to a height that would be difficult for the creature to see and then hid. Supposing it did see her, it didn't seem likely that the large creature would be able to climb the tree. It would be possible to wait it out there until help arrived. I haven't climbed a tree since I was a kid, Kajino whispered in a low voice as I sat on a split branch. Yeah, me too, I whispered back. At that moment, we heard the sound of something walking in the snow below. Kawamaya whispered something. It's here! I looked down between the branches. The wide back of that thing, covered in black fur, crossed my line of sight. It looked like a large rock walking on four legs. It walked up beside the tree we were hiding in. 
It didn't show any signs that it would look up. I almost let out a sigh before I could stop myself. Then it stood up and started sniffing. It was picking up our scent. Panicking, I held my breath again and froze on the spot. We hadn't banked on it being able to pick up our scents. We watched the creature moving below, lamenting that we couldn't control the smell of our own bodies. But perhaps our prayers were answered, because it got back down on all fours again and moved away from the tree. We all slowly let out the breaths we were holding. When the creature's front legs touched the ground, it seemed to look up at us for just a moment, but perhaps I was just being over-anxious. Suddenly the ground seemed to rumble, and the tree shook with tremendous impact. It swayed left and right, like it had been hit by a typhoon. I clung desperately to the branch I was on, somehow managing to ride it out, and then I looked down below. The creature's red eyes glowed brightly as it looked up at us. It stepped away from the tree, and with a run-up, it smashed its large body into the tree. The tree shook left and right again. So it had noticed us then. And it was trying to make us fall from the tree. The creature slammed into the tree a third time. The tree shook tremendously. At this rate, we would fall from the tree like fruit hanging from a branch. No, the creature might even break the tree itself before that happened. We have to do something, I thought, and then Sasaki screamed. Instinctively, I turned towards her. She was hanging from a branch with both hands. The creature stopped hitting the tree and approached her. It reached up for her with its hand, but just missed. But it was just a matter of time until Sasaki would get tired and let go. Hang on, I'm coming! Kajino started moving towards her. I grabbed his arm. Leave her be. We can't help her now. Let go of me! You're just gonna get yourself killed for no reason! Leave me alone! Kajino tried to shake me off, and when I looked into his eyes, I suddenly understood why he was so desperately trying to save Sasaki. But I couldn't just let him throw his life away like that. She loves Kizawa, not you. Kajino stopped moving. I followed that up with another attack, even though I knew it was mean. That child inside her isn't yours. But Kajino slowly shook his head. That doesn't matter. It's nothing. He said it quietly, yet full of conviction. The moment I heard his answer, it was like some kind of spell cast over me broke. It was like a single ray of light in this dark forest full of nothing but despair. I let go of his hand and passed him the mountaineering knife in my pocket. Take this. It has protected me all this time. Kajino smiled as he took it. Thanks. He put the knife in his belt, and then started crawling across the branch towards Sasaki. He edged closer to her on his stomach, and then held out his hand. The creature down below stood up and waited for the Sasaki fruit to fall. Sasaki, grab on! 
Sasaki reached out with one hand and tried to grab him. She was within reach. But then, she pulled back. I'm sorry. She faintly smiled, and then let go of the branch. Before she hit the ground, the creature grabbed her and bit into her neck. It then threw her body away and looked up at us, blood staining its teeth, and let out a strange sound. No doubt about it. It was laughing. Kajino grabbed my knife. Takeda-san, I'll stop this thing. You use this opportunity to run away. Before I had the chance to stop him, Kajino jumped down. He plunged the knife towards the creature's defenseless face and into its red sparkling right eye. Die, you monster! Kajino pushed the knife further in. The creature's roars reverberated throughout the dark forest. Run! Now! As Kajino screamed up at us, the creature batted him away with its front paws. He went flying into a nearby tree. His body twisted into a strange shape. Kajino! I tried to jump down, but a hand grabbed my shoulder from behind. It was Kawamae. We have to get away from here. But Kajino is... Kawamae shook his head. Do you want his life to go to waste? I looked down at the creature in stunned silence. The creature was pouring at its face, trying to get the knife out as it howled. I nodded and jumped down from the branch. I waited for Kawamaya to jump down and then ran in the opposite direction of that creature. I ran and ran and kept running. The two of us slipped through the trees in front of us, jumped over the thickets, and pushed through the snow. The forest continued on and on. Did it even have an end? Would we never be able to escape it? Or would we die here too? Horrid thoughts flooded my brain. Tree after tree appeared from the darkness before us, and they took the shape of the departed I'd only known for a few hours. Murata, Kizawa, Sasaki, Kajino. And between those trees was the figure of Miho. She looked just like she did in that dream, her eyes glaring at me, full of hatred. Miho, Kizawa, and Sasaki are dead. So why are you still looking at me that way? Why do your eyes look at me that way? I cast my eyes down as I ran by the Miho tree that said nothing. When I looked up again, the exit came into view. Past the forest was a snowy slope. It was rather steep, but there was no other way. Kawamaya and I nodded at each other and started to throw ourselves up the slope. As we started back down, we found the bus that we had escaped from just hours earlier lying across from us. I approached the steel coffin that had once been a bus with uncertain steps. In the end, had it already been decided that I would be unable to escape from this bus? As I glanced at the bare chassis, I suddenly noticed something black clumped on the front wheel shaft, like a cloth that had been soaked up in water. I called Kawamaya over and pointed to it. It was about the size of a dog, with long hair and 
nails growing from a single leg. I lifted the bloody flesh and declared, It's that creature's child. Poamaya-san, that black thing you saw was this. I see. It got stuck in the shaft and that's why the steering wheel wouldn't turn. He muttered and hung his head. We had finally uncovered the truth. I then said in a trembling voice, And then that creature, the parent, chased us, trying to get revenge for killing its child. Yeah, it was just the same as me. Its very own blood had died, and it was out for revenge. I held my head in my hands. At that moment, a roar echoed from the slope. The creature was back. When its single red eye saw what I was holding in my hand, it let out another roar and then bounded down the slope with incredible speed. Now knowing what it was after, I was left with two choices. I could accept its revenge, or refuse it. As I thought it over, I realised the area stank of gasoline, and turned to look at the bus. Gasoline was pouring out of the tank. I readied myself. I took my lighter out of my pocket. Miho gave it to me for my birthday last autumn. I turned to look at Kawamae. Kawamae-san, I'm going to lure that thing into the bus now, so you go and hide in the bushes. I jerked towards the bushes with my chin and handed him the lighter. Thirty seconds after that thing disappears into the bus, light it with this. I'll come running out once it's lit. Kawamaya-san looked at the lighter with surprise for a moment, as I explained, but then he quickly nodded. Thirty seconds. Yeah. Leave it to me. I returned the nod and then ran towards the bus. I circled around to the rear window. The creature, having descended the slope, turned its face towards me. The area around its right eye was wet and black. I raised its child high in the air. Over here! Your child is over here, asshole! The creature roared in anger. It roared loudly once, and then ran for me. I bent down and then climbed into the bus through the broken rear window. The lights inside had already gone out. But the moonlight shining through the window dimly conveyed the state of the bus. The dead bodies of the passengers entered my line of sight. I felt bad that they were about to get involved in this battle with the creature. I walked forward, careful not to stand on any of them, and the creature twisted itself into the bus. It stood on those who had lost their lives without care, crushing them underfoot, edging closer and closer on all fours. I started counting in my head. I probably wouldn't be able to see the second hand in this darkness, and I had no time to look anyway. The bus was lying on its side. I carefully edged backwards between the roof and the chairs so I didn't fall over. I could feel glass being crushed beneath my feet. Suddenly, that giant creature ran at me with a speed I could never have imagined and closed the distance between us. I held my breath. My ears felt hot. I reached a count of twenty in my head. Still ten more seconds left until the time we arranged. 
Hanging around any longer would be dangerous, I thought, so I decided to run right away. There were still 10 seconds left, but I thought it would be dangerous to hang around any longer, so I decided to run. Leaving ahead of schedule meant there was a chance that the creature to might escape as well, but there was nothing else I could do. Here! You can have it! I tossed the creature's child that I was holding. The creature panicked and caught it. I used that opportunity to turn and ran for the broken windscreen. The creature roared. It filled the narrow space inside the bus and the glass above my head wobbled. When I reached the driver's seat, I could hear the sound of flames burning behind me. But we hadn't reached the 30 second mark yet. Even so, you could say that was superb timing, considering that I was trying to escape before then anyway. I put my feet on the chair and jumped off right at once, flying out the front windscreen. When I landed on the snow, I quickly stood up and ran straight ahead. I had to get as far away from the bus as I could. The gas tank should be about to explode at any moment. Finally, a massive blast ripped through the air with a gust of wind behind me. There was an ear-splitting explosion and all the bones throughout my body shook. Then a gust of flames assaulted me. It sent me flying several meters through the air before I landed on the snow. The snow that went flying in the blast landed on top of me. I could also hear the creature's roars mixed in with the sound of the burning flames. It sounded like its final death scream. I let out a deep sigh, lifted my head, and realised I was lying on the edge of a cliff. The ground cut off right in front of my eyes, and darkness spread out before me. I couldn't tell how high I was, but I could clearly hear the sound of a river down below. Just as I tried to stand up, something collided with my back, and I fell backwards into the snow. Something stood on my chest and grasped my throat. What terrifying power! With my head sticking over the edge of the cliff, the figure had stolen my ability to move freely. It was Kawamae. I had meant to kill you with that monster, but you sure did pick a great time to escape, huh? Yamahashi Shou-san. Kawamaya looked down at me. H How do you know my name? I asked in a hoarse voice. Because I heard about you almost daily from your younger sister, but I didn't realize that it was you right away. I only realized when I saw this. Kawamaya held up the lighter I gave him with his free hand. I gave this to Miho myself. As I looked at the lighter, I remembered that the bus company that Kawamaya worked for was also part of the same travel company that Miho worked for. Of course Miho and the others at the travel agency used a bus from their same company. And Miho said during her final phone call that her boyfriend would also be going on the ski trip as well. I see. So you're the boyfriend Miho talked about from the same company. Kawamaya nodded. I hadn't once imagined that her boyfriend might be the bus driver. I thought he had to be one of the passengers. Which means... Miho's final letter. I remembered the part where she said, Betrayed by you, 
who I trusted the most. So it was you that Miho wrote about in her final letter. Kawamaya started to laugh when he heard that, but he didn't seem to be enjoying himself at all. I see. So you really came all this way without knowing anything, huh? What? What don't I know? As I asked that, Kawamaya stopped laughing and started squeezing my neck even tighter. I choked. Let me tell you. Kawamaya leaned in closer. He looked much older than when I first saw him. The person Miho wrote about in her final letter was you. You're lying! I choked out. But I was unable to escape, Kawamaya keeping me well pinned down. It's the truth, he said quietly. Miho loved you. All the power drained from my body. I lost all desire to fight back. You're telling me she jumped because... That's right. Because she learnt that you got engaged. Kawamaya continued. I listened in stunned silence. Miho always talked about you, and I listened thinking what good siblings you were. I thought she loved you dearly as an older brother, but that wasn't it. She loved you as a man, not as a brother. The moon hid behind the clouds once again, and snow started to fall. The snow was dyed orange in the light reflected from the flames of the bus. The snow itself seemed to be on fire. Miho called me one day two weeks ago, crying and saying she needed to apologise to me for something. I pressed her to keep talking and she said she was in love with her own brother. But the day before he got engaged to another girl so she had lost all reason to live. That was why she intended to jump and end her life, she said. I unconsciously shook my head, but Kawamaya kept talking. It was so sudden that I couldn't say anything. As I remained silent, she told me that she just dated me because she was hoping to get your attention, and apologised. Then she hung up without waiting for me to reply. I continued shaking my head. I'm not lying. Having said that, Kawamaya pulled a folded envelope out of his pocket with his free hand. I ran over to her apartment right after that phone call. I was too late and got there right after she jumped. Kawamaya stopped talking for a moment and wiped his eyes with his sleeve. As I approached the veranda, I found the envelope with her suicide note in it. After I read it, I put the envelope in my pocket and left just the contents in their original place. Then I left before anyone else arrived. I took just the envelope because then people would know who she was talking about in that letter. Kawamaya wiped his tears again, opened the envelope and showed it to me. In the middle of this regular brown envelope, to Yamahashi Shou-sama, was written in Miho's familiar hand. You understand why I didn't want anyone to see this, right? He crushed the envelope in his hand. Because I wanted to take revenge against her older brother with my own two hands. Kawamaya and I were two peas in a pod. He was also prepared to go to hell. He loved Miho from the bottom of his heart. Why did you come here? 
Was it really for the same reason as me? A faint smile rose on his lips. I nodded. Then, I'll take revenge instead. His faint grin floated in front of my face as he got closer, and whispered, On you. Kawamaya stood up and brought his foot up above my head. I didn't resist. I nodded. Kawamaya stood up and brought his foot up above my head. I didn't resist. The only thing that had changed was which side of revenge I was on. I remembered that dream I had of Miho glaring at me with those hate-filled eyes. Now I fully understood why she looked at me like that. Somebody had to pay. I closed my eyes. Suddenly, a large shadow towered above Kawamae. The air filled with the unique scent of burning hair. It was the creature. It was alive. Its remaining red eye had also been lost in the fire. Yet it sniffed us out and the earth rumbled as it charged. It ran right into Kawamae as he stood above me. Two figures flew over my head and disappeared into the darkness. When they had completely disappeared, I heard a splash in the valley below. I wasn't able to help him this time. The mountains in the distance changed from black to a dim grey. It was daybreak. I could see the shape of a helicopter coming this way from beyond the mountains. The bus continued to burn. The snow lit by the flames danced in the darkness. I wished the snow would burn me up, but all it did was fall softly upon my face. When they took me to a hospital at the foot of the mountain, a police officer told me they found Kawamaya's dead body downriver. But they said they found no trace of the bear that had fallen over the edge with him. I didn't recall ever calling the creature a bear, but all I said was, Is that so? The officer said they would do their best to find the bear for the safety of the locals, regardless of whether it was alive or dead. I figured it didn't matter either way whether the creature was alive or dead. If it was still alive, then it was no doubt dead on the inside, just like that of its beloved. I understood that feeling very well, because I felt the exact same way.